same sort of manner. Thinking in this same sort of manner is how our brain also allows our biases to, to, to get into those empty spots of our brain where we can't make the leap, we can't make the connection. I also like to use an example of vacation. So if I say the word vacation in the chat, tell me what, what's your first thought? When I say the word vacation, what comes to your mind? Camping, beach, Hawaii, a lot of things, right? I'm going to tip my camera down a little bit so you can see my whole face. But yeah, a lot of things come to your mind when you think of vacation. But for many people, like for me, for example, I don't think of a beach as a vacation. I think of a road trip. I think of getting in the car and driving. And so when I have an opportunity to start thinking about vacations, it never dawns on me to think of looking for beach vacations. Did you know that that's a bias? I'm biased toward what I like. I'm biased toward my preferences. Some are harmful, some are harmless, like the vacation. But we take those same biases and we place them on individuals. We place our preferences on individuals, and that's where our biases come up. When deep-seated attributes and stereotypes impact our actions, decisions, and understandings, without us being conscious of it, we allow outside influences, we allow allow those other things to determine our thought process. And when we're not familiar, we reach back in our past, back in our, our history, and we try to make sense of it. But what happens is sometimes we're wrong. Sometimes the way that we pattern map, the way that we attempt to make sense of it is a little bit off. And so then our biases they get in the way of us being really fully able to make proper decisions based on everything we know, because what, everything we know is limited. Implicit bias, as you can see here, it's implied, though not plainly expressed. Like if you've ever been in a conversation with someone and you leave that conversation and you think, just a little bit off. I, I can't put my finger on it, but it was just a little bit off. It's implicit. You don't know. When an issue is explicit, so when the bias is explicit, it's obvious. There's no room for confusion. It leaves no room for doubt. It's crystal clear. And not only you, but everyone in the conversation is aware of it. Where does implicit bias come in? And I think at this time, Joe, did you want to take a quick break? I see you say stretch your legs, grab a drink and a snack. Is, is that correct? Oh, sorry about that. That was just, I forgot to remove that. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> so let's talk for a second about where implicit bias comes from, the root of it. And Joe is going to talk about that for a little bit. Hey, let me oh, one second, Kelly. I don't know. I'm kind of having trouble, Joe, clicking and yeah, don't finding where I'm at. Are you having some screen? Yeah. Um, it's okay. I can take. Uh, I can move the mouse real quick. Let me just do something. All right. There we go. All right. And I'm unmuting my video. All right. We're all good. Y'all can see me, right? Cool. All right. So um, when 
when Kelly and I were working on this, we really wanted to approach the question of where does implicit bias come from? Um, and I started reflecting on my own story of what is my experience with implicit bias? How does my perception of myself and others came, come to be? So I decided I was gonna tell you all a story. Um, this is, it's a story about me. Um, so my name is Joe. I'm gonna introduce myself again. My name is Joe. Um, I just see they pronouns. And I was born in Boriquen, or it's uh, also known as Puerto Rico. So it's this little island that you see right in the middle of the Caribbean Sea next to Dominican Republic and Haiti. Um, I was born August 25th, 1993. I was the uh, the second of three children born to a, uh, a multiracial mother and a black father. Um, we, you know, we, we weren't, we weren't rich. We, we were okay. Um, like we had school, we had everything that we needed. We didn't have luxuries, but you know, it's never something that we thought about, um, at least like when we were younger. Um, my first language is Spanish. I, Puerto Rico is a Hispanic country, mostly Spanish speaking. There's some English speaking. Um, there is a long history and tradition of, um, you know, Catholicism. Uh, it's Catholicism, not necessarily just um, in practice, but it's, it's ingrained in the culture um, anywhere from, for, so to give you all an example, we don't have, uh, we don't have spring break. We have Holy Week. And that's what the week that everybody gets off and everybody gets Good Friday and Easter, even if you don't believe in Christianity or, or don't prescribe to that faith. Uh, so that's how ingrained it is in our culture. So I was born into all these things that were already in place. Um, I don't know. I don't know what these mean yet. Uh, but as I grow up, I start learning what these, um, you know, how how do I fit into this? a society that I was born into. So uh, yours one to five, uh, I'm growing up. I am trying to get my idea of what the world is, like how do I need to engage with others? Uh, what is the appropriate way to engage my, uh, my elders? What is the appropriate way to behave? What is good, what is bad? Uh, and Usually that comes in through pain. You know, I touch fire and it burns me. So I know that's a bad thing. Um, I eat uh, cookies and they make me happy. So I know those are good. Um, and it teaches me who, uh, who I can show my affection to, who is going to receive that. It's also the point where I, uh, it's starting to, I start to receive my expectations. Like what do my parents expect of me? What does my sister, my community expected me. Um, I don't know the reason why these expectations are in place. I just know that if I want to continue to be part of this group, I need to prescribe to these. Um, I need to uh, make sure that I am playing with trucks because that's what little boys do. Uh, I need to make sure that I start looking at sports or go making sure that you know my hair was like really short because that's how we, that's how it was. Um, and again, I have no reason to question these things because I'm simply learning. I have no reason to question them at this point. I am now older than five years old. I, it's my first time going into school. I still carry all these ex expectations in me, uh, all these things that I learned from years one, zero to five. And now I am in school where I'm, you know, for the most part, it's the first time that I am with my peers. Uh, children who may have had a similar or somewhat different upbringing than I did, um, that we're all in the same place, we're not super supervised, um, but I, I start seeing people that for the first time I feel like, oh, maybe these people get where I'm coming from. Um, I start learning in school, like what is like history, what are our celebrations, one of my favorite celebrations um, in my school growing up was that for Christmas, we always did this uh, like Christmas event and every single class had to do some sort of performance or contribution to the event. Uh, and I always thought that was a lot of fun. Um, and it also, 
teaches me like what to say and what not to say. How do I interact not only with people who are in my immediate circle, like my family or, or my friends, but also how do I interact with people who are strangers, people who don't know me, people who the, the only opinion or, or the only perception that I have is like that they're older than me or that they look a certain way. Um, and also, what am I look? What am I seeing in, in television? These are all the things that start informing the way that not only um, how I need to see myself, but also like what does society think is valuable? Like what is so valuable that needs to be shown on TV? And is this what is? And this is like how we establish these cultural standards. So again, now I'm in middle in middle school and high school. You know, we we've gotten some. Uh, understanding of like what our role and what our expectations of societies are. We continue to learn all this stuff in school, not only through formal education, but also when you're interacting in the schoolyard, when you are um, in your sports practices or in your extracurricular activities, like you start noticing these things that are either explicit or, or implicit, but that will only help you re uh, retain that group membership. Um, at this point in time, uh, in my personal journey, um, I start noticing that there's like a certain difference uh, of the way that people are treated based on how they, how well or how not well they can, like they stay within the norm. You know, they prescribe to like this, what the group's perception is of like normal. Um, at this time around, um, any any boy that had a high pitched voice or um, had like uh, kind of like very active mannerisms, like that's considered like not okay. That's considered uh, queer and gay, and like obviously at the time that's not good. So being different was overall perceived as a bad thing, um, and as a tactic of survival, then we always I always try to like stay prescribed to like as much of that as possible. Um, not stand out too much. Um, so it's something that at this point in time, it's very obvious what for me was acceptable and wasn't acceptable. Um, but all of these things is not just like what I notice from the outside. What do I start noticing about myself? Is is what I'm saying, or is what I'm is is what I think of myself? How I feel inside is does it prescribe or does it fit within like my everybody else expects of me. And if it doesn't, then I need to repress it. So I'm a young adult in high school. We have all of these things weighing down on me. Um, I don't know. I just take all these things. I, at this, I mean, I, every, ever since I was like pretty young and I've noticed it, like when you start noticing people of other genders and I always knew that I was gay um, and it's something that, um, I also knew that it wasn't okay, uh, based on like what I learned throughout society. And like, um, of course, like at that time, I didn't know that gay did not mean that sexuality and gender identity are not the same thing and that they're not necessarily interrelated, but these are all things that I started to hate about myself. Um, it also made me super conscious of the way that I spoke. I needed to make sure that, you know, my voice wasn't too high because I didn't want to be perceived a certain way. I needed to make sure that I didn't stand out too much, uh, that I didn't look at uh, a guy that I had a crush on too much to make sure that I didn't out myself. Um, so all of these things that society has already told me that it's not acceptable. Um, I needed to make sure that I repressed it. And if I couldn't repress it, then I personally would, you know, start <laughs> hating myself. I was like, oh my God, I can't do this. Like, why, why do I do this to myself? Um, I feel guilty for feeling the way that I did. Um, and then at the same time, I started externalizing those things as like, oh, like anybody who expresses this way should not, you know, they're not doing it properly. They need to hide it. And it's not just like what I was feeling on the inside. It's like, how was I ex explaining that or, or showing that against my, or towards my relationship with other people? So, the result, and this is ongoing, um, throughout our lives, we get all of these things from our family, our friends, the media, um, our, our school, our books, um, the expectations, the, those little conversations 
that we have throughout um, our lives in the grocery store, in the bookstore, in the at Walmart, um, that really start building not only our sense of self, but also how does that sense of self fit into our society? Is it acceptable? Is it something that, you know, I can do this safely? Is it something that um, it's wrong, something that's wrong with me? So this is us, this is a representation of me and my adulthood, how now I have all these things that I've learned throughout my life and I have to choose whether I accept these as they are or if I have to unpack these, unlearn them. Um, so this is a crossroad. So very long way uh, to answer the question, where do implicit biases come from? Um, and everything that I was experiencing wasn't until it was later in life that I had the words and the verbiage and the knowledge and the space to explore where these all meant and why did I think the way that I thought. So um, I came across this. Uh, so this is what is called the cycle of socialization. Uh, this cycle was proposed by Bob Carroll, who's a scholar uh, of sociology. And it kind of explains uh, the general journey of folks um, and how we get socialized and how we get perceptions and implicit biases and, and, uh, and perceptions and ideas of like what it is, what's our role in society uh, and how that plays out throughout our lives. Um, so we start when we're born, where things are already set. Um, and after that, we go to our first socialization. Uh, and this is where our expectations are communicated to us, our traditions, uh, stereotypes, and myths. This is when we first start learning about those things. Uh, boys play with cars, girls play with dolls. Um, we have missing information. Like, you know, we, we start learning all these things, but we don't really understand why. And we don't question it either. Um, because our, our purpose right uh, at that point is not to question the information, is to learn as much as we can so that we can fit into society. Um, and the same thing with uh, values and dreams. What is it that you can and can't do? Um, what are your roles uh, and responsibilities? Um, so I, um, I remember when I was younger, um, my dad used to tell me and my brother, um, you got to make sure that you marry white, you know, you got to fix the race. Uh, I didn't really understand what that meant um, until later in life where I had the opportunity to unpack that. Um, and also I noticed that <laughs> my dad, uh, my dad is black. My mom is multiracial, but she, she is very light skinned. So it is this idea that in order for us to be able to be successful, we need to make sure that our generations approach whiteness as much as possible. Um, so in hindsight, it was like white was desirable and, and black is something that we needed to improve upon. So after that, we go to school where we, uh, where we, we have these, these influences from like the culture and like the different institutions, family and friends, uh, the school, what your teachers are teaching you, the people who are portrayed in, in, in history books. If you're part of a religious institution, what what values and perceptions are they communicating for you and that, that are appropriate? What who do we see represented in media? How do you see people who look like you um, or act like you interact with the government and legal systems, as well as like what are the cultural standards? Um, so we have all of this that's coming and we're dragging all these things. These look like steps, but it's actually they're building upon each other. And then we have the internalized. Uh, which could be, um, this is where bias like really starts ingraining itself as, as something that it's, it could be either for our own, like in benefit of our in-group, but it could also be against our own, um, our own identities. And this could be, um, you start relating sanctions and stigma, like for a certain way that I look, I know that if I do something like the Oh, the sanctions for this were going to be greater than if somebody else does it. So, like, I start learning, like, what am I? What are, what are the limitations for me? Um, you also start learning that human difference is, is negative, um, and our conscious and unconscious beliefs and attitudes are starting to be ingrained because we see how they play out in society. It's not just like having them; it's seeing how they actually impact the way that you navigate life. And as a result, 
we fear we feel dissonance there's silence guilt anger and self-hatred we try to isolate these identities outside of what it means to be human um, there's um, ignorance and at times there could be internalized oppression um, or dominance like asserting dominance over groups that we feel like are inferior um, so up to this point, everything is inside of our heads. What happens then is that all of these things inform our actions or our inactions as well. So we want to make sure that whatever we do, it doesn't make waves. It doesn't stir up the general uh, the general group. We promote status quo and we also um, recognize change as bad. Um, and this, start, this cycle then starts over and over again. And then in our core, then all this fuels confusion, hurt, anger, uh, and fear. However, um, uh, Bobby Hara proposes a, a way out. Um, and some of these, at, at these steps, like not everything is necessarily something that we can change. We cannot change who, where we're born, what country, what race, what, um, what social economic class necessarily like we're born into at the moment. Um, and we can't change what our first socialization looks like because at this point, we're not necessarily conscious that we need to do this. However, when we get to the point where we really are at crossroads of making a decisions on, or whether we act on our internalized biases, we can make a, con a conscious change to, or a conscious decision to change. And this means raising consciousness, not only of your own biases, um, but also of the way that these play out in society um, and other ways like interrupting the cycle, making sure that you know, if there's something, questioning the reasons that we think the way that we do, making sure that we're edu educating ourselves and educating others when we have a choice or when we have an option and taking a stand when possible, questioning and really questioning like why we think the way that we think, uh, which is actually a very interesting exercise um, and also reframing. Uh, it's very common, or at least for me in my, in my upbringing, it was very common for me to blame myself for certain misfortunes. You know, at times I did stupid stuff, that's fine. Um, but there are definitely things that uh, in hindsight, like it would have it happened to me regardless. Um, so reframing that and, and trying to understand that there are things that are out of my control. Um, and there are things that it's just something that I would, it's part of the culture and society. That does not make it okay. Um, so throw out a lot at you. We're gonna take a five minute break. Um, let's uh, stretch your legs, grab a drink, make sure you grab a snack. Um, and we'll come back in five minutes. It is 7.45 on my clock. So we'll come back in 7.50. Um, and we'll be also taking a look at the chat in case you have any questions that we can answer. Uh, the chat or anything like that. So I'll see you all in a little bit.
are back um perfect all right so i am going to pass it on to kelly uh to continue our time together today take it away kelly i do thank you i just want to take a second and just thank joe for sharing his story growing up i will say one of for and me, one of the most difficult things is sharing experiences, those hard experiences that you often go through as a person of color and navigating this world that you at times feel is not made for you or navigating in a society that you feel at times is not built for you to succeed. So to give those experiences out and to share them can be very difficult. And so I just wanted to take a second and just say thank you to Joe for sharing that. And if you can imagine for a second, if we have any backpackers in the group, I'm definitely not a backpacker. If backpacker is German for watching Netflix, then I'm a backpacker. <laughs> um, so I see a couple thumbs up. Um, so imagine carrying your bag on your back. I don't know how, what the, you know, usual weight is for your bag, but imagine if that bag is all of your life experiences, your history, your, the things you care about. Imagine carrying that bag of just your regular life experiences around with you. Now, imagine carrying another bag that is full of 
those heartbreaking moments that you have no control over, those moments where you feel oppressed, those moments where you, where you feel ignored, um, those moments where you feel um, dehumanized or minimized because of your race or your ethnic origin. Like imagine that, carrying that extra backpack around. We often use that example to explain just the heaviness that comes from navigating this world. Over the last year, a lot of these conversations have really come to the surface, um, probably very heavily in the summertime. I remember very heavily in summer being really engaged in many of these conversations and holding back as much as I can as to not give too much of myself away. This, because a lot of these experiences belong to me and it's hard to give them away. They've what made me who I am. They've what those experiences are what, you know, has happened to me. And I think, okay, I'm never doing that again. You know, those, those heart wrenching experiences. And um, uh, yeah, let me make my speaker louder. Can you hear me better now? So let's talk a little bit more and go a little bit more specific into those, the comments and the things that often happen to people of color that over time pick away at us and over time minimize us or make us feel invisible or if we're not there. So moving on to the next slide, we're gonna talk about microaggressions. My information I'm gonna share with you from this slide, or actually this presentation portion, comes mostly from the American Psychological Association and from um, the Harvard Business Review. So microaggressions are brief. They, in, in a little bit, we'll go through a slide and kind of look at you know, what they are. But first, let me send out a poll. I want to kind of find out where you are in your experiences. The poll question reads, and then Joe will pull it up, but it reads, I have observed negative comments or behavior relating to my own or someone else's and then here are your options. Age, religion or religious beliefs, disability, sex, race or ethnicity, sexuality, nationality, economic background, gender identity, or none of the above. We'll give you 30 seconds to answer that poll. I wanna see where everybody's at. Ten more seconds. Got about twenty people out there still thinking. And remember, this is either your own personal experience or you observed it from someone else. Into the end poll, and we'll share them. Just as I suspected, sex is a little more. But if you'll notice, out of 48 of you that responded, none of you said, none of you selected none of the above, which tells me that we've all been impacted by these negative comments, negative behaviors that have either been, you know, that have struck us 
or struck people around us. Also interesting to remember, when we go a little bit more into microaggressions, microaggressions aren't limited to race. Everyone experiences it, whether it's age or religion or nationality. But it's not just reserved for people of color. It can be damaging and not always in the short run. Oftentimes the pain and the hurt that comes from these experiences, these microaggressions, over time people weigh at an individual. And if you're never heard, if you're never allowed to heal from that or never able to overcome that, then what do you do? You have family and friends and you just move it down to the next generation. And then now who's carrying the hurt? The next generation. They go through the same thing. They go unheard. They go unresolved. And then what do they do? Move it down to the next generation. And it continues on and on. So the generational hurt, the generational pain that comes from these interactions, and not just microaggressions, again, remember, implicit and explicit bias is also out there. Moving on to the next slide, let's take a, uh, take a look at um, the chart we have. We're looking at having experiences with microaggressions, and we look at it by racial group. It's broken down here, and this is from a, Ga a, a Gallup poll it's fairly recently from this summer. Take a second and look through some of those questions. Along the top, we have Black adults, Hispanic adults, Asian adults, and white adults. And the questions range, but typically, what we're seeing here is a pattern. The pattern is that people of color are often, often carry this burden. Imagine walking around life knowing that there are people act as if they're better than you, not for any reason other than the color of your skin. People act as if they thought you were not smart. What does that do a person? What does that person lose over time? And then imagine if you are smart and you know you're smart. You know it, not only because your mom told you, <laughs> like you know it, you know you're smart. Yet in a school setting, you're made to feel as though you're not. Think of the long-term damage that does. It's psychological. And as I mentioned a moment ago, it moves on from generation to generation. Looking at a few more questions on the left-hand column. You were treated with less courtesy than other people. And again, look at the percentages and look at the racial group that's responding. Look at those numbers. I know there's a lot of us in here. There's 63 of us currently, but What do you think, what, do, what does this chart tell you? Put it in chart or in the chat. And if you have a couple, you do have a couple minutes, if somebody wants to come off of their mute, I don't know if that's, if that's blocked in the group, but I want to hear from one or two people. When you see this chart, what does it say to you? What are your thoughts?
Neely, you made a great point in chat. And let me know if I'm off, but I feel like what you're saying is that we're putting a burden on certain groups of individuals that is not then equally put on other groups. For me, empathy is and being empathetic to another struggle or to another's pain speaks volumes. Because what do we hear sometimes when we have someone that shares something with us or they say, you know, you know, I, I was at work and and um, my boss said something inappropriate to me. And I think it's because it was my race. If the first thought is to downplay it or to think, oh, they probably misunderstood what the boss said or the boss, pro your boss probably meant something else. Where are these microaggressions come into play? We see the, the word micro in front. And so we think of it as maybe being a small thing, but it has such a large impact. I can tell you from experience, very devastating. Thank you for all of your comments. And Helen, you're right. It's it's a daily lift. It is a weekly, it is a lifetime, lifetime lift. Imagine lifting that your whole life. And still having to manage everything. You're managing your in-group. You're having to manage other groups. You're having to manage everything all at the same time. And still work to fit in. To fit into the groups that you feel like you need to in order to be successful. It can be exhausting. So we'll move on for in just one second from this chart. But... One of the, the questions I really wanted to hi highlight on here was the second to last question where it says, people acted as if they were afraid of you. When I read that, that really like struck me as a mom of boys, of three black boys who will one day be black men walking through this world without me, you know, <laughs> hovering over them or Hovering around, I'm, I won't be far, trust me. I'll, I'll be nearby them for the rest of their life. I can't help it, but um, imagine that. Feeling as though people around you are worried about you. The weight that comes with that can be heavy. So let's move on to the next slide. Let's watch a video. Not very long. So we'll watch a video, then we'll So you're not good at golf, but you're white. People of color have to deal with racial microaggressions every single day. So microaggressions are those little unintentional insults that basically see people of color as stereotypes, which got me thinking, what if white people had to deal with racial microaggressions? So like, where are you from? No, no, like, where are you really from? Why do you have an accent? Like a, like a Swedish accent. You know, your English is really, really good. It's like, I can't even tell you have an accent or anything. I don't have an accent. No, that's what I'm saying. You don't speak Gaelic? You don't speak German? Can you say a curse word in European? You know, like, what does that even mean? <laughs> hey, Connor, um, you know about NASCAR stuff, right? Um, can you take a look at this? Can you teach me how to line dance? Play the banjo. Act entitled in the supermarket. I love white food. No real flavor to it. Never an upset tummy. You're so exotic. How do you get your hair like that? I love how it's so limp. Ew, why does it feel like that? Oh my God, so it just does that? No, you are really pretty for a white girl. Your eyes are so round, like this. You know who you look like? Kenny Chesney. Zach Braff. Emma Stone. Rachel Maddow. My friend Chad. Maybe you know him, because he's white too. No, Emma Watson. Not Macklemore, what's the, what's the other guy? No, is it Emma Thompson? It's C-H-A-D, like Chad. One of the Emmas, you look like an Emma. You know who you look like? I bet you hear this all the time. Jeffrey Dahmer. How does it feel to be the token white guy in the office? Hey, Connor, can we get a white perspective on this? I love everything about white culture. You guys are like so fun. What do you mean you don't listen to Creed? You're white. You've never tried math. 
to your wife. You don't act like a normal white person. You're not really white, though. You're not really white. <laughs> I'm whiter than you are. So, did all your ancestors own slaves? No, but of course he wishes that he could still own slaves. That's a part of his culture. Right, spack me up on this one. The thing you have to understand about white culture no, is that white people are... No, I went to an historically are... white college, so okay, I know about white culture. Okay, but I backpacked in okay, Europe. That... So can you say how ridiculous this was? I know. Story of my life. If you've ever experienced microaggressions because of your race, gender, sexuality, or body type, go ahead and vent about it in the comments. Can you teach me how to, like, take a really popular rap song and, like, make it a ukulele song? Thanks, Jen. So, you're not good at... Okay. Move to the next slide, okay. So just like empathy is important to always have, throughout this journey, throughout this process of becoming more aware, more conscious, conscious of ourselves and our communications with others, there's also a, a level of self-reflection that's also necessary. Looking at that video, what did you think about the situation? And what's your opinion about this situation if, if the roles were reversed. So I'm, I'm going to be 100% you know, total disclosure honest with you. When I first saw that video, I kind of thought it was funny. I thought, oh, this is funny. Like I chuckled at it. But I instantly was reminded, you know, why, why was this funny to me yet if the roles were reversed, I would have been watching it probably with a tear in my eye. But why was it funny that when the situation was, was flipped? And so I, I kind of started drilling down into that thinking, you know, wh why is that with me? You know, what am I missing? And you can add your um, answers to those two questions in the chat if you like about the situation in this video and what you think it would have been like if the roles were reversed. But I'll share with you my, my experience in looking at it. I realized that it was so unfamiliar to me that I, I didn't know how to respond. And so chuckling or laughing was the only thing I could think of because it was so unfamiliar. Like I've never seen that, never seen the roles reversed like that. So moving on to the next slide, let's look at some of the things we say on the subject of microaggressions. And let, let's think for a second, is this me? Have I done that? And if it is, there's a section right below it is what it implies. So we, we say a lot of little things that we kind of shrug off as maybe not thinking as a big deal. But, but remember the definition of microaggressions. They are brief and commonplace verbal behavioral behaviors that communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative slights or comments, especially toward members of minority or oppressed groups. And remember, microaggressions are not reserved only for people of color. But let's take a look at some of these and see where we fall. The first one, when someone says, when I see you, I don't see color. How many people have heard that? I can't even count how many times. Multiple times. Those are the words they're saying. But what they are implying, they're signaling that the person does not acknowledge another's blackness or the impacts that racism has had in their life, whether in their lifetime or whether, again, generational, brought down from their mother or their father. Right in the center of the slide, We're all one race, the human race. If I got a dime for every time I heard that, 
we'd all be in Hawaii right now. <laughs> what do they mean? What is being implied when someone says that? They're signaling that the experience as a racial minority, and so again, not just a black person, but a person of color in general, black and brown individuals. What they're saying is that there's no difference, that your experience is the same as the next person. And think about the experiences you've had in your life that have absolutely made you who you are, that have shaped you into the person you are, regardless of your race. Imagine someone telling you that doesn't matter. I need you to ignore that for just a second and act like that didn't happen, imagine. The next one is, you are so articulate. Seems harmful on the surface, right? You're, you're telling someone, oh, you're speaking so well. You're so articulate. But what, what they're really implying is that black people are not usually capable of competent intellectual conversation. You're right, Joe. It seems like a comment, but, but what? Yeah, Megan, you're right, it's belittling. And just like so many of the other microaggressions you experience, in, exactly, Amelia, you're right. It's not just for one group of individuals, but it's extremely belittling and harmful. Okay, next slide. Let's look through three more microaggressions that we often hear. Everyone can succeed in society if they work hard enough. This implies that desperate outcomes for black and brown people is a result of their laziness. This we see in a lot of ways, right? Not just in the school system, this in um, social organization, this in a lot of places. But one of the things to always keep in mind is that you have to think about two things, intent and impact. What is your intent? And what is the impact? Our next slide will talk about that difference in what supersedes the other and why. Okay, so the next one. Where are you really from? This signals that they're not American, that they're a foreigner, and even more deeper, and even more hurtful that they don't belong. And then the last one here is, what do black people think about that? And earlier, Joe and I were talking and I was trying to kind of think, okay, what kind of experience have I, where have I heard this before and in other ways? So for example, when a crime happens or when, um, you know, something bad happens to one race, you often hear people sometimes say, well, are you gonna speak up and say that that's wrong? Like, why should I have to do it for the whole race? But when one person is asked to speak for an entire race, it oversimplifies not just that individual, but the group that they belong to telling me maybe I'm not that important. I'm just one of a group. And so these are examples of statements that we often hear when it comes to microaggressions. Let's move to the next slide and let's talk just for a second about what we do now. And so this is often the struggle when we have these types of great discussions about race and implicit bias we sometimes hear the problems. This is a problem, that is a problem. Oh, this happened to me, that happened to me. 
But when we get past that point and we get to the, okay, what can I do now to be better? What can I change about myself to be better? These are some of the things that, that, that I've come up with um, from my source. So first of all, it takes work. It's not a one-time thing. There may be some of you that leave this workshop and, and you're good to go. You're ready to, you know, march down Cushman and you're ready to roll. But <laughs> that's not always the case. For many, this is a journey. This is a long journey of, okay, where am I at right now? What can I do now to make an impact that I can be consistent with? and not give up on when I get stressed and overwhelmed. And I'll tell you around summer, fall time, I was overwhelmed with everything that was going on. And so how do you get to that point where you are at this higher level of conscience, where you're, where you're con conscious of what you're doing and what you're saying, but also to a point where you're also able to live the rest of your life, right? <laughs> because this isn't everything. This is, but this is part of everything. And so what are some steps you can take? So what do you do now? First, remember that intent does not supersede impact. So with those examples I shared with you in this, those last two previous slides, it's clear what the intent was, but that does not supersede the impact that it has on the individual that long lasting hurtful impact. And so number one, be conscious of that impact. Going, looking down one step on the slide, seek to understand. Understand the experiences of your peers, your black and brown peers, your bosses and employees without making them responsible to educate you because that's your responsibility. It's not theirs. Although there may be a heightened you know, burden put on them at that time, there are many that are willing and able to do that. Don't assume they all are. Some are getting to the point where they're like, okay, I'm gonna need you to figure some of this out on your own and then follow up with me later. So seek to understand first. Next, top right-hand corner, believe your black and brown colleagues when they choose to share their insights with you. Uh, don't get defensive and don't play devil's advocate. Meaning knowing the, 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 the weight that is on them by simply bringing it up, recognize that and listen, be there, don't under, don't try to minimize it. And get comfortable rethinking much of what you thought was true about the world and your workplace and accept that you likely been complicit in producing inequity. Just like one black person isn't responsible for everything that happens in the black community, you're also not, white people are also not responsible for everything that happens in the white community. That doesn't even make any sense. Like, it doesn't even make any sense. So, um, but enter the conversation, enter with the understanding that I'm gonna have to rethink what I'm doing. I'm gonna have to be sure that, you know, where I'm at is right. I'm gonna pass it back over to Joe. And Joe, are we here till 8.30 or nine o'clock? Oh, sorry. There you go. Uh, we we're scheduled till nine, but uh, no, no worries. We got this. <laughs> um, all right, so thank you so much, uh, Kelly. Um, so moving on, we talked about microaggressions. We talked about where implicit bias comes from. Um, so I want to talk about like where, uh, where we can start to contribute to the solution. So if microaggressions are the problem, then I want to introduce microaffirmations as a solution. 
I don't think it's an all encompassing solution. Micro affirmations do not resolve systemic racism, but they start building an inclusive, safe, welcoming environment. So micro affirmations, um, it's small acts, which are often hard to see, they're ephemeral, uh, and they're either public or private. And they're also often unconscious, but they're very effective, um, which occur whenever people wish to help others succeed. It seems like a very abstract thing. Uh, however, when we validate somebody's experience, when we um, acknowledge and uh, recognize that some people may have a different experience to us based on a certain identity that they hold, then we can start creating an environment where these people feel, uh, where people feel comfortable sharing, they feel safe, they feel heard and understood. So um, I want to talk about three types of micro affirmations. And the first one is being proactive. Um, and we talked about this a little bit ago, how important in whenever we want to do equity work or racial justice work or social justice work in, in not just uh, any, any work that, may, that we're looking to make life better for everyone, it's, a self, it's also part of a self-reflective process. Um, so some ways that we can be proactive is conducting a bias audit. So a bias audit is when we sit down and really take a chance to really think about the way that we think and the why behind that. Um, so knowing what do I carry? What are the identities that I carry? In what context do I carry these identities? Also, what biases, what are my perspectives? Like, what are my assumptions that I make that I make about the people that I interact with? Um, are these conscious or conscious? Are these good or bad? And also um, recognizing these biases is the first step to not act upon them. So the second one, recognizing that uh, the differences in people's experiences based on uh, their race, uh, specifically today, because we're talking in a racial justice series, uh, we'll focus on race, but this applies to any social identity. Um, but recognizing that our experience or, or my experience as an afro taino person is different than somebody who is Asian, who's somebody who is, um, who is in UPAC. Um, and understanding that, that, that their experience is going to be different and, and um, you know, not making any assumptions that I know what that experience is like. The third one is identifying where you hold privilege. Um, and then after that is once you realize in what spaces and in what contexts do I, do I hold privilege, then leveraging that privilege to uplift people who don't have that privilege. Um, people often ask me like, is privilege a bad thing? And my answer to that is no, privilege is a great thing. I wish everybody had privilege. Um, Unfortunately, that's not the case. Not every, there are a lot of situations where folks don't have privilege. However, myself as a male presenting person, I hold privilege in certain spaces. So how can I use my privilege to uplift those who don't have a privilege in that space to make, to make room to, to acknowledge that in some cases, these people's voice may not be heard and I can use my privilege to uplift it. So, talked about micro affirmations uh, and um, it might seem something that's tedious, but here are some simple ways that we can micro affirm. Uh, the first one is active listening, which it focuses on hearing clearly what is being shared and demonstrated through eye contact, having an open body posture, uh, summarizing statements and or asking any qualifying questions to ensure that you understand. I think the key is understanding and empathy um, also recognizing and validating experiences, uh, which involves uh, trying to understand the what, why, and how, and, and um, you know, appreciating what this person is sharing with you and like what they want you to gain, uh, understand from it. It is helpful to delve deeper by uh, identifying or validating any constructive behaviors that anybody manifests. 
uh, or respond to uh, an experience, expressing care about the effects of like an event, also demonstrating a willingness to think through a productive path forward. Um, so one thing that people, uh, or that I like to share, uh, and it's something that I, that I have learned to do for myself is um, I, when I talk to my partner, my partner is white. Um, we, we've had to establish like a way in which we can communicate effectively. Sometimes I just want to vent. Sometimes I'm looking for somebody to help me work through something. Um, so right now what we do is uh, when we, hey, I need to talk to you. He's like, okay, do you need me to support you? Do you need me to uh, vent with you? Do you need me to just like sit here and listen? And that way I feel validated and I, I gain from the moment like what I'm seeing, like the support that I'm needing. Um, and then also affirming uh, emotional reactions uh, through verbal acknowledgments uh, that they have experienced through something exciting, frustrating, that it's hurtful. Um, that really helps the conversation uh, to focus on turning those feelings towards action that will empower, heal, and also help, uh, help learning. Um, I want to talk about calling in instead of calling out. Um, so, and this is something that is, it's really helpful um, whenever we're confronting microaggressions as they happen. Um, as we learned earlier when we were talking about the cycle of socialization, um, microaggressions uh, are informed by years of uh, of things that we've internalized, that we've learned of like what is acceptable, what is not acceptable. Um, and that in this work that we are hoping that we're all collectively building a safe and inclusive community. So calling in rather than calling out, we don't wanna, uh, and this is something that I, that I practice uh, whenever I'm confronting uh, any, any microaggressions that I feel comfortable confronting. Um, for example, if um, somebody says, you're so articulate, like we were talking about earlier, um, hey, like, I understand that you, you uh, or I guess like, I, I heard you say this, like, this is like how I feel about it. Um, I'm just wondering like, which, like, what do you mean by it? Um, and I know I saw earlier in the comments about how, um, like, can a teacher call a black student articulate? Um, and I think it's very important for us to reflect on the reason we're doing it and um, understanding that even if our intent is to compliment the student, it may have a negative impact. And um, so as, as, as Kelly mentioned earlier, our impact always carries more weight than our intent. And we do acknowledge that even if we have the best intentions at heart, we may be doing something that's detrimental. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit as well. Um, some helpful tips. Um, it's not, there, there are many ways to confront microaggressions, but I wanted to give you all like a good formula that, um, that I've used. Um, it's called open the front door um, and it's OTFD. It stands for observe, think, feel, and desire. Um, sometimes for me, it was really hard to, um, it was really hard for me to articulate like when I wanted to confront a, a microaggression, um, yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll give an example of, of calling in actually, right, with this, with this process. Um, I've always struggled with finding like the right language to confront something and calling somebody in rather than calling somebody out. Um, because I wanted to make sure that like my conversation that I, that I, that I left that interaction feeling like I was productive and that I was constructive and working towards a more inclusive space. So observe. So the first one is clearly describing what you see is happening. Let's say um, that there is a group of, uh, you have a group of, of leaders um, and they all happen to be uh, white uh, leaders and uh, they're talking about diversity, but you're not including your people of color. Um, so you observe clearly describing what you see is happening as a person who's in that situation is like, hey, I noticed that we are talking about this topic and we don't have a, a, a person of color's perspective. We don't have an indigenous perspective. Um, 
I think that we cannot, you all can see like, I think how I, uh, we cannot have a, a constructive conversation when we don't include the people who are mostly impacted. Uh, and I feel like um, we can do better as a group. So I would like for us to either postpone this meeting or introduce or, or, or tap these people or, or ask for, for feedback or find a way to include people in this conversation. So as you all can see, I went through those steps of observing, thinking, which uh, stating like what I think about the situation, expressing how you feel about it, and then what do you want to happen to resolve the situation? Um, one of the important things with this is that it won't always come out perfect, um, but we should always aim for being genuine and being authentic rather than making this like perfect uh, speech, if that makes sense. Uh, yes. All right, so in the chat, I want us to uh, just share some good ways that you or someone else have addressed or confronted a microaggression. Um, and the reason I ask you all because um, my experience with microaggressions is limited because I am only one person. Um, but I think that together we can all collectively help each other, you know, give us, give tips and, and how do we confront microaggressions? How do we call somebody in? Uh, or maybe you've witnessed something that, you know, it's worthwhile sharing. Uh, so please take, take a moment to add those to the chat. And Pauline, I see your comment that the civil experience community says, not about us, without us. Yes, I love that. Because you cannot really have a conversation about a community if you don't include those people in it. You even say, ouch. Yeah. So uh, Shoshana, uh, when you said, um, from your comment, Amelia you saying, ouch, um, I remember uh, attending a workshop for, uh, from Native Movement. And that was the first time that I heard that uh, oops and ouch uh, rule. Uh, basically is establishing that at the beginning, hey, if somebody says something offensive, like acknowledging first that we're all here to learn and unlearn um, and saying ouch uh, when somebody says something that's offensive. And if you catch yourself saying that's offensive, you say oops. Um, um, I see Helen, I joined it called out use my privilege and say it, yes. Um, and I feel like that for me is like a very, like, like I, that's like my, like my initial, my, my, my head initially goes there. I was like, wait, I had to hold myself down. I was like, no, I want to have a constructive conversation, but yes. Reminding the person that impact is more important and can be explained after the impact is acknowledged. Yeah, thank you all so much for sharing that. All right, looking at the time. Um, so another, oh wait, did I, did I, oh, I just went back, that's why. So I want to talk about when missteps happen. Um, um, as Kelly mentioned earlier that we all contribute to an inequity and it's something that, um, to me, it hit really hard when I first like reflected on it. It's like, like, what do I do, you know, as a, as a Afro Taino, queer person, how could I contribute to this? Um, but by upholding like situations or, or ideals that are detrimental either to myself, my own in-group um, or other in-groups, like I've had to work with myself and I continue to work on myself to unlearn of these things, but missteps are likely to happen. So what happens when they do? Um, as we've been talking and like, I, if you take anything away from our time together today is that our impact always carries more weight than our intent. Um, and that once uh, I, somebody uh, phrased it really well in, in the chat that once we acknowledge uh, our impact, then our intent can be explained. Um, also, when let's say that we, we, we say something that's offensive or, or make a prejudicial comment um, you know, try not to dis dismiss or diminish the feelings that are uh, being had or the reaction. Um, trying the, your best not to get defensive and uh, recognizing it as a misstep and then commit to learning. 
Um, one thing um, that folks, and this is not necessarily tied to race, but I think it, it's very really relevant to this, uh, to when missteps happen, um, when somebody accidentally misgenders someone, um, or when, some, when somebody says something, actually it can apply to race, when somebody says something that's not, um, that's not appropriate and like they get called in or even called out, um, then the person, then like feelings of guilt may be, may be present. We may feel like, oh, I'm so sorry. Like I will never do anything. I could, how could I ever do this? Like, I'm so sorry. And then suddenly the person who experienced the microaggression is consoling you for having done a microaggression. Um, so it's recognizing it as a mess step, committing to learning and then moving on because it's not about you. It's about the moment it's had, we, uh, we acknowledge it and then we move on so that we can continue. Um, and I think that's like a really good way to like approach things to make sure that we are not centering ourselves when we are, uh, when we can uh, unintentionally or intentionally make these offenses, uh, but we are centering the growth and acknowledging the impact and then moving on. All right, so what does it take uh, for us to build this inclusive community? The first is self-work. This is something that um, it does not matter how many years of experience you have. It does not matter how many PhDs you have in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Self-work is always going to be necessary. Um, it takes courage. It's not always easy confronting microaggressions or racism or, um, or any inequity or a particular situation. Uh, because like we, we also, we can't ignore that we are also people. We have our own barriers. We have our own uh, history, our own learned, exp uh, learned experiences. So it does take courage. It's courageous. But, and finally, we need empathy, acknowledging that our goal is to build a, a safe, inclusive, welcoming, respectful, and anti-racist society where people can feel comfortable coming together talking about their experiences where they're going to feel validated, uh, they're going to feel heard, they're going to feel uh, like they belong and they're going to feel understood. So with that, I want to thank you all so much for being here today. Um, please submit any questions through the chat. Um, and if you have any general questions about the NAACP, feel free to submit them here. Um, we're not done yet. Uh, we have a Q&A session. Uh, we'll, we'll be addressing uh, some of the questions that we did not address throughout the presentation. So please uh, think, stay in, and if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. And uh, Diane, to answer your question, uh, we are currently recording and then um, in the next few days, we'll be sending out the recording to all who registered. Joe and Kelly, thank you so much. This was this was amazing. Your the slides with like the the quotes and the examples below, as well as you know Joe going over like a specific format of of how to conduct micro affirmations was absolutely amazing. Uh, thank you both for your energy, your vulnerability, your time, and uh, and your experiences that uh, that you've shared with us today. Uh, one of the the first questions I think that came up was if, if you'd be willing to talk about your, your healing process or some, some parts of your healing process when dealing with microaggressions. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that question came up when I was sharing my story. Um, uh, and Kelly, feel free to like share your, your own journey. I, I, I would love to hear it too. Um, but in my, my personal experience, which is not the same as anybody. Um, I think for me, um, I realized that I needed to remove myself from like this space that I was in, in order for me to be able to isolate my own experience and explore that. So um, I moved to Alaska. That's how I started. Uh, <laughs> 
Uh, so I moved 5,000 miles away. I, I think that's the number. It might be way more. Um, and in here where I didn't feel like I had the pressures of, or anybody had any expectations of myself or, or of me or anything like that, then I feel like I could explore. Uh, first, I started by exploring my, my, uh, my sexuality and my, my sexual orientation um, and like what that meant to me, what I wanted to do with this information. Do I want it to share? Do I want it to keep, keep keeping that inside of me. Um, and then uh, after that, I feel like it was harder for me to explore my, my racial identity and like what that meant. Um, just because it was so, if, uh, if anything what, like was ingrained, it was that. Um, I remember when I was in, in middle school, um, one of the things that I always hated about myself was my hair. Um, like uh, the standard of beauty or like the people who were considered uh, pretty or beautiful were those who had like, somehow they were Puerto Ricans with blonde hair and blue eyes um, and straight hair. Uh, you wanted to have, I think when I was in middle school, like uh, you remember the punk hairstyle that was like spiky hair up, like that was all the rage and I wanted that. Um, so my mom at the time was working as a hairstylist. So I snuck into her, uh, her station and I, uh, I'm gonna say borrowed um, some chemical straight hair straightener, um, and I tried to straighten my hair. Um, that did not end pretty because the next day we had to go to the beach, and uh, chemical straightener and hair and <laughs> and sun, you know, 100 degree heat does not bode well. So my head, my hair turned orange. Um, it was very interesting, and so I had to tell my mom what happened. Uh, so, so that we can, you know, try to salvage my hair as much as possible. Um, one thing that I think about now is that um, she never questioned why I did it, um, which is like really interesting to me uh, to think about it. Um, but it, it wasn't until I was able to remove myself that I can see it from like a 3000 foot view and see like what was actually like, why did I feel the way that I felt? Um, and so first was acknowledgement, and then I started working. I was like, wait, now I need to really see myself as part of this beautiful culture, this beautiful heritage. Um, it's something that I'm still working through, and I don't think I'll ever be done working through. Um, but you know, being able to say that I have, pr I'm proud of like my African ancestry. I'm proud of my Taino ancestors. I'm proud of all these things, and I need to learn how to continue to love myself consistently so thank you and Kelly I know you had some stuff you want to share yeah mine is pretty quick as an adult my coping mechanism is Hulu and Netflix like I'm not kidding with you I <laughs> love my shows and uh, I love being home where I'm comfortable with people that know me and I don't have to I can own I can be myself and it doesn't matter but I do recall being very young um I think I was 12 I kind of think of where we live and um I remember one day I had an experience where someone had called me um, a derogatory term it completely knocked me off my feet and I thought what in the world like it really shook me and I remember going home and being really sad about it and this feeling came over me as a 12 year old you know not really knowing really where it was but i remember being 12 and this thought came in my mind and the thought was that the the voice in my head <laughs> told me that i'm worth everything you're worth everything kelly and i remember sitting there and i knew exactly what it meant and i knew exactly and from there, I was unfazed. And not that I haven't had stumbles along the way or, you know, had those angry moments where I'm like, this person doesn't know me, you know, but I remember that very clearly. I had green carpet. I, my room was in the basement and I had green carpet halfway up the wall. And, you know, I didn't visualize it. But um, I knew at that moment that I was worth everything and that there was nothing that could take me off of that path. And yeah, that's 
five hooks. I love oh eight. I just need to make you a co hooks. There you go. Now you can unmute yourself. Thanks. Uh, thank you both for sharing. Those were um, those were excellent answers. Yeah, <laughs> and so so much thought process that's gone into it. And and uh, yeah, thank you for sharing. That was that was wonderful. Um, maybe I think you know your your examples of calling in and calling out, Joe, were awesome. I think people would love to maybe hear a couple more if either of you would would be willing to talk about kind of what that would look like a scenario and then what would that would look like on on someone's end to to interrupt it. I I love that I love the examples you used, Joe, and I love that idea of calling in versus calling out. Um, for me when I when I think of calling in, I think I I visualize, you know, bringing that person into me, bring them closer me and so for me calling someone in is a private thing and I've done it many times as an adult just talking to someone in private you know what you said really hurt me and this is why if someone doesn't know if they hurt you if they don't know any better how are we going to expect them to do better and so when I call someone out it's out they're not in they're out and you know it's public and so for me, it's whether I'm calling, bringing someone closer to me to talk to them or pushing them further away by doing something public and out loud. Um, I think, uh, and thank you, Kelly, so much for, for sharing that because I 100% agree that, you know, I think that one thing that we need to be conscious of it's not whether calling in or calling out is like you're it's like one thing that's better than the other that I think that's um not necessarily the point I think the point is more being intentional about like what it is that you're trying to achieve at that point like are you trying to call somebody out if that's what you're trying to do you know and you did it then I guess like objectively speaking you were successful you called somebody out um but if your goal is to build a like construct construct this like safe space for everybody in that, you know, a place where people feel comfortable coming forward with their biases and exploring those and growing and learning and unlearning, then I feel like it takes a certain level of emotional and like uh, awareness where what, what works for you, uh, like Kelly mentioned, is like sometimes it's pulling somebody apart and be like, hey, like what you said, like having that this, it had this impact and, um, and you can also, like, I'm, I'm, I'm an educator, so I work with students a lot. Um, and sometimes things are set, for example, in like a workshop. And I think it's an opportunity because I understand that some people may be thinking the same way. So I think that, hey, like, that's a really interesting point. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about the potential impacts of it. Um, I think it's important for me not to call somebody like you are a racist because you said this. It's more of like, hey, like what you said had this impact. Um, um, I'm not sure <laughs> if I'm giving you like plenty of examples. Um, um, but I think for me, that's what's worked. Um, generally, um, people are less resistant when that's the approach. Um, when we are and you explain, hey, like we're just here, to, we're here to unlearn and, uh, and learn. Um, and that's been helpful. Another thing that's been helpful is to make sure that when you are having these discussions that you intentionally have built this space for that. So it takes some like preparation, uh, some uh, meal prep, if you will. Um, make it, so to give you all an example, um, I facilitate workshops on uh, identity and intersectionality. And one thing that I start with is ground rules. Um, I always say that um, we, uh, we're not here to question anybody's experience. We're here to validate and value each other. Um, we acknowledge when we make an impact or when we have a negative impact and um, understand that our intent is not more important. Um, we are here to learn. So building that space intentionally 
uh, beforehand, before any, before you may even encounter any of these situations. It's it's really valuable. Thank you. Yeah, I loved your analogy of of bringing people in, right? And and so looking at it not as something that's a uh, that's like this this like really scary confrontational thing, but instead it's like bringing people in and being like, no, come on, come on in, or we'll just, we'll help you out here. We're like, we'll, we'll do a little guiding, right? I love that, that's awesome. And I also wanna say, um, looking at the comments, you are absolutely right, Kate. Sometimes I'll tell you over the last year, I have not had the space to do it. Joe is nodding your head, you know. Joe has been with me the last year. <laughs> sometimes you just can't do it and sometimes you just have to let people go you have to let them go you have to let them go and you have to let them figure it out on their own and it's okay to do that to completely release those people back into the wild and let them just go and heal yourself but if you have the space and the time then do it but if not don't do it watch your show instead right and I think one of the things I think about when I those those like first couple moments of of like hearing something and being like all right what am I going to do about it is is I always remind myself like who am I accountable to who are the people that that I'm that I'm accountable to and that that always seems to to help me align myself um so for for any attempting white allies like myself that's what I remember is that I'm accountable to folks of color I'm not accountable to that person's comfort All right. Well, I, you know, we're about at about five minutes or so. And so uh, if we could go ahead and, and kind of wrap it up. And so I know that there's, uh, we're hoping to send out a feedback form. Uh, there should be a slide with a little QR code on it. Um, you know, and, and also uh, both for both feedback and then also donations, this is, this is all uh, done by, by volunteers essentially. Uh, and so, so any sort of support to continue to run these programs, we really appreciate. And the feedback is something that, that everyone at the NAACP Fairbanks within the leadership and within the, the working, the committee that works on this looks over and, and to pick topics for the next time to think about who we're gonna have in to think about uh, how we'll, we'll continue to make this series uh, better and better every time. And so we really appreciate you taking those couple moments to do the feedback. Joe, Kelly, anything else you'd, you'd like to add? I just wanna thank everybody for being here. Um, for some of us, this is new. This change is new. For some of us, we've been in it for a long time, for generations on the receiving end we're doing on all ends sometimes and so i just want to thank everybody for being here on the thursday night and being brave enough to have this conversation now that you have it please go back out in the community and and be it uh, thank you kelly and um thank you all again for being here today um this really means a lot to me when i uh any any equity social justice work can be very lonely. Uh, it can be very draining. It can be emotionally taxing. Um, but it's really, it's really nice to see that there's people interested in making this community better, um, acknowledging that there's still a lot of work to do, um, but not feeling alone. So I want to thank the committee uh, who's worked with me throughout this entire, like the past like year in making these events happen. Um, and Kelly, thank you so much for being here today. Um, and uh, Kelly and I have worked together <laughs> a lot this past year. Um, so it's, al it's always like really nice to uh, be able to like rely on each other and support each other through this journey. Um, let's see, um, option one. Yes, I can copy that into the chat. Um, One second. Sorry, it takes me a while. Oh, 
and then it's PO box. This is really awkward. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> Seven. And then. All right, there you go. Um, yeah. And we'll be sending out the recording to this session, as well as some additional resources that Kelly and I kind of uh, put together to continue exploring microaggressions and, and you know, aiding in our self-work. Um, and you'll get a, a link or a copy of the slides as well. Um, yeah. So thank you all so much for being here today. And yes, uh, you can share the presentation. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Kelly and Joe.